محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد نصركم الله ببدر وأنتم أذلة فاتقوا الله لعلكم تشكرون أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, Baqiyatillah Al-A'zam Ruhi wa arwahu al-alamin lahu al-fida in Latin your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad <clears throat> Respected elders, sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh the 17th of the holy month of Ramadan, a day like today, marks an important event in Islamic history and one that most of us were raised in recognizing and understanding to a certain extent because it was in the second year after Hijrah on the 17th of the blessed holy month of Ramadan that the famous battle of Badr took place, a battle that was significant and pivotal within the history of the religion of Islam that shaped the future and has relevance to you and I in many shapes and many different ways. We have always been told about Badr and its importance as the first major victory for Muslims against polytheists. But of course, further investigation reveals that perhaps what we've been told about the Battle of Badr remains to be superficial, something that requires a little bit more of an in-depth look and an analysis. I was blessed last month to visit the site of the Battle of Badr. It is situated approximately 153 kilometers south west of Medina, about 300 kilometers from Mecca to Al-Mukarrama. And when I went there, I, for the first time in my life, I was able to somehow imagine the battle right in front of me. You see, the problem is many people who go to Umrah and they go for Hajj. In Medina, they are taken to important sites such as the site of the Battle of Uhud. They see the site of the Battle of Khandaq and they're given a bit of a description, which is great. Because many a times, we need to link ourselves to history. But Badr, because it's a bit far, it takes about two hours out of Medina. And until recently, the authorities did not allow those on a Umrah or Hajj visa to venture out of the city. Now you're able to do so for many people. You are not necessarily exposing yourself to an in-depth analysis and a look as to exactly what happened. But not only what happened in Badr, but also how did it take place and the repercussions of the battle because many a times when you and I discuss the awaited savior Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadhar Ajjal Allahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif We are constantly told there are how many of his generals that we expect to be the best of the best the creme de la creme how many of them are they? 313 these 313 occupy a pivotal position in our teachings, no doubt. But how many a times have we linked this number to a battle such as the Battle of Badr? Because the number of the companions and the army of the Muslims on the day of Badr, without a shadow of a doubt, according to majority of historians, was what? Was 313. Therefore, there is a connection that can be drawn between the battle itself and indeed the future, what I pr practically call the positive practical history, PPH. Something that we need to develop in our lives. What does that mean? Many a times when I look at an historical event, or when I study a past occurrence, I look at it from a perspective of a narration that I enjoy understanding what happened before me. But the Qur'an invites us to examine historical accounts from a different lens. Allah Taala discusses the lives of so many prophets. How many prophets are discussed in the Qur'an? How many? 
How many prophets are mentioned by name in the Quran? Nearly. 25. 25 prophets are mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. Allah Taala, when He tells us about Yusuf, when He tells us about Yunus, Ibrahim, Musa, when He tells us about Dhil Kifil, all these illustrious individuals, it's not for you and I just to recite the Quran in the month of Ramadan and think, wow, mashallah, these were amazing human beings. They achieved so much. Allah is asking us this question, if you were in their shoes, what would you do? What are the challenges that they faced? And today, are you facing similar challenges? So that's what's called the philosophy of religion. That's what's called as positive, practical, historical analysis. I need to look at history and think, you know what? It is relevant to my life. What are the important contemporary lessons that I can be drawing from this important event? Question. What is the number one book for the seerah of the Holy Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him and his family. If someone was to come and tell you, what is the number one book of history that I can learn the biography of Rasulullah? Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, which one is it? What's the name of the number one book that we can learn history of the Prophet? Any ideas? Any recommendations if someone asks you, I want to learn about history? The number one book is the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details the events of the life of the Prophet of Islam in such a brilliant manner that most of us, unfortunately, we don't pay attention. But the details relating the incidents such as Badr, such as Hunayn, such as Uhud, such as Khandaq, there is one chapter in the Quran that's named after a battle. And that's Ahzab, chapter 33. Yet Allah mentions Badr, mentions Hunayn, mentions Uhud, not by name, but through a number of ayat. Mentions a number of expeditions, mentions a number of key points such as the conquest of Mecca, Fatih Mecca, which also happened in the month of Ramadan, on the 20th of the month of Ramadan in the year 8 after Hijrah, incidentally. Just for your information, and if there is a quiz sometime in the future, Kahoot, you can use this. And that is what? Majority of the battles in the history of Islam at the time of the Prophet happened either in Shah Ramadan or in Shawwal. So Uhud happened in Shawwal. Badr in Ramadan. Hunayn, end of Ramadan. Conquest of Mecca, Ramadan. And why? Because subhanAllah, when you're fasting, you, Allah wa ta'ala is saying that you know you are going through the bigger jihad. I will make you go through the minor jihad too. Because you have the strength to say no to your desires. And that's the greatest struggle. Now you're going to have to go through what? You're going to have to go through the minor struggle, which is jihadul azghar. So what is interesting is, when I look at the history of Badr, I need to extrapolate these key things. But from the Quran, I'd like to tell you where you can find the story of Badr in the Quran. And the beauty of the Quran is it doesn't limit the story to one ayah or one surah. So according to my research, there are 49 verses in the Quran scattered all over the book that describe Badr. Where are they? Surah Ali Imran, ayah 12 and 13. Surah An-Nisa, ayah 77 and 78. Surah Ali Imran, 123 to 127. And Surah Al-Anfal, majority of the story of Badr is found in Surah Al-Anfal. Surah Al-Anfal, verse number 1 to verse number 19, verse number 36 to 51, and verse number 67 to 71. So, what is interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the battle of Badr Yawm Al-Furqan. Furqan means what distinguishes haqq from batil, what distinguishes the truth from falsehood. So the day of Badr was a great day in which the truth emerged. And most of us realize that many a times in our battles or in any struggle in life, if I'm victorious from day one, it sets me on a good beginning. And both Quraysh and the Muslim army knew that victory in Badr was absolutely necessary because it was the first time they're both confronting each other. So I'd like to give you and I some background, we constantly refer to the Quran about Badr, but key to it is what does it mean to you and I today as we look at this important event in Islamic history 
as we go through it on the 17th of the holy month of Ramadan. In order to understand the battle of Badr, Ghazwat Badr or Ma'arakat Badr, we have to recognize that Quraysh had two trips, caravans, in order to obtain and sell trade. Quran tells us in Surah Quraysh, they would go during two seasons. Which two seasons are they? They would go during the summer and during the winter. In the summer, which city did they used to go to? Any ideas? Which city did they used to go in the summer? They used to go towards Sham. And in the winter, they used to go towards Yemen. So summer towards Syria, winter towards the area of Yemen. In order to buy products, in order to sell items in Medina and in across the Hejaz. Now, the Mushrikeen of Mecca, what did they do? When the Muslims left, migrated towards Medina, they started a campaign of hatred, intimidation, persecution. They took away their belongings. They started to torture them even more. So Muslims who were in Medina heard about their families suffering in Mecca because there were still some Muslims who remained in Mecca or they had possessions that were usurped and taken away. Therefore, al Nabi Al-Akram wa Rasul Al-A'zam Muhammad Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam received the revelation, Surah Al-Hajj, Ayah number 39. Udhina lil-ladhina yuqataluna bi-annahum zulimu. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Holy Prophet, you and the Muslims are going through oppression. Now you have permission to fight back. Now you can go. So the Prophet of Islam decided to raid certain caravans of Quraysh that were moving during the summer. Towards which area? Sham. So... He decided to send a group of Muslims to interject some of these tri uh, caravans of Quraysh. Now someone will ask, is that correct? Is that possible? Why should the Prophet attack? It wasn't the Muslims who attacked. It was the Quraysh who are what? Causing oppression against the Muslims. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here quantifies and says, you are now allowed to fight. Why? Because you're going through zulm, you're going through oppression. Your belongings, your people are subject to injustice. Therefore, the Prophet of Islam decided that this had to be done. And so, what happened was that there was a caravan of Quraysh headed by Abu Sufyan. And this particular caravan was interesting because there were about 40, 50 or 70 people with Abu Sufyan. And it had... Thousands of worth of what? Of commodities, dinar. So it was a very rich caravan. And the Prophet of Islam decided that that caravan has to be attacked, ransacked, and the belongings taken in compensation for what Quraysh was doing in Mecca. But what happened to Abu Sufyan was that when he was in Sham, yes, Saif, Rahlat al Shita, it was Saif. He was smart enough to investigate, to try and ask, did you see people watching our caravan? He would say to people and he would give them money until two people told him, yes, we, we saw two unusual individuals, unusual meaning that they were not usually from this area, constantly watching your caravan. He immediately realized that Muslims are going to attack. So he changed his path. Instead of going on the conventional route back to Mecca, he took a different route in order to avoid his caravan being attacked. But what did he do? He sent a messenger to Mecca and said to the messenger, tell the Quraysh, Muslims are coming, they're going to attack my caravan, come and help me. In Mecca, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, who knows who Safiya is? How is she related to the Prophet? Safiya? Any ideas? Auntie. Her sister is Atika. They are both daughters of Abdul Muttalib. Yes? And therefore, they are sisters of Abdullah and Abu Talib. Yes? And others. Now, and Hamza. So what happened was, 
that she saw a dream in Mecca. What was her dream? She saw that a man somehow stood up on the mountain of Abi Qubais, took a piece of rock and scattered it on every household in Mecca and screamed. So when she woke up, she was shaken. So she said to people like Abu Jahl Allah, and others, she said to him that I saw this dream. Abu Jahl said, this is, you are one of the prophets of Abdul Muttalib. This is your, your the second prophet mocking her. But he said, we'll wait for three days. If nothing happens, then I will declare you and all of Bani Hashim as the biggest liars. After three days of her seeing this dream, what happened? This man came. Who is this man? The messenger of Abu Sufyan. Says to Quraysh in Mecca, notice the army of Muslims are going to attack this caravan. You need to prepare yourselves. Abu Jahl, who is the arch coordinator of the army of Quraysh, decided to assemble a huge army of a thousand soldiers. And these thousand soldiers, by the way, were not all on foot. According to historical records, many of them were, had cavalry such as horses and camels. How many specifically? There were 700 camels and there were 100 horses. This is significant. I'm giving you details. Why? You'll see how the army of Muslims was significantly disadvantaged more than the army of the non-believers, the polytheists of Quraysh. Because the army of Muslims later would have only a handful of camels and horses. That's it. Whereas the army of Quraysh had hundreds. So when he prepares this army, the holy prophet in Medina, he gathers the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him these ayat in Surah Al-Anfal. كَمَا أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ Allah is telling you, leave Medina now. And it is the truth. You must leave Medina. So the Prophet of Islam gathers the Sahaba. Please understand this. This is agreed by Sunni and Shi'i. This is an academic discussion. I'm not bashing anyone. This is agreed by all Muslims, yes? As far as my research is concerned, from different historical texts. When the Prophet looked at the companions and said, the Quraysh is now assembling a huge army. We are going to go and fight them. What do you th say? What do you think? The first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, innaha Quraysh. Sorry, we're not fighting. Quraysh is too big. It's going to defeat us. We can't. They're huge in number. The Prophet said, Ijlis, sit down. The second person who stood up, usually after the first, because after number one comes number two usually. And that's the second Khalifa who stood up, said exactly the same as the first. That you know, we cannot defeat Quraysh. There are too many. The Prophet said, sit down. The third individual who stood up was Al-Maqdad ibn Al-Aswad. Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, who was one of the companions of the Prophet, but also close to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Salamullahi alayhi. Al-Maqdad said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you command us and you tell us what to do. Whatever you say, we will do. We will not say to you what Bani Israel said to Musa. اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إنها هنا قاعدون We will not say to you what they said that you, O Musa, go and fight. We will sit here. We will say to you اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إنا معكما مقاتلون We will fight with you, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet smiled. According to the riwayah, he was so happy with the answer of Miqdad. Then he looked at the head of the a tribe of Khazraj, Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, and said, what do you say? He also stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, we gave you allegiance, we gave you bay'ah, we will fight with you. Whatever you say, we will follow. And so, now the Muslim army was ready. How many were they? As we said, 313. They left Medina around the day of 13 or 14 of the month of Ramadan. And they headed towards this particular area. Now, what is interesting is, once the companions had agreed about the Prophet moving, the Prophet of Islam said something beautiful to them. 
Just one important contemporary lesson here. Please focus on this. And that is, the Holy Prophet of God did not have to consult them. Rasulullah did not have to ask them. He could have just commanded them and said, everyone goes. Yet it was number one, the great leadership skills of the brilliant and the best who wanted to ensure that his army are fully aware of what's going on, number one. Number two, they feel part of the plan. They feel that they're not just necessarily being led, but they're being consulted and advised. And that was a brilliant method used by the Holy Prophet of Islam. وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ He would consult. And that's a lesson for all leaders, all people in places of authority and those who are in charge. And that is, it's okay to lead. It's okay to tell people what to do. But it's also very much advised to sometimes sit with the people and ask them, what do you think? Consult with them. Discuss with them. Take their opinions. And the Prophet of Islam would show and display remarkable leadership qualities. When they were about to leave, the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised me either victory against Quraysh or we would get that caravan. لَقَدْ وَعَدَنِي رَبِّي أَحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَيْنِ One of them. And subhanAllah, you know when I was studying Badr, I was constantly linking it to Karbala. You know Sayyid al-Shuhada on that night, the eve of Ashura, when he said to his Sahaba, Go, you are now free from my allegiance. You don't need to stay. They said, how can we leave you? How can we desert you? How can we be disloyal to you? Then, according to Riwayat, he showed them their place in Jannah when they passed the test. When they were loyal and firm on the path, Imam alayhi salam would give them these glad tidings. Now, as they continued their journey towards Badr, they only had a few camels. According to narrations, what they had to do, majority of them walk, and then they would share the camel. So three or four would sit on a camel, right? And uh, they would, for, for example, come down and so on. The Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, did the same. So they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. You need to be on a horse or a camel all the time. You can't be walking. The Prophet refused. He said to them, Ma antum aqwa minni, wala ana azhadu fil ajri minkum. You are not stronger than me. Neither are you more desperate for reward than I am. Meaning that I want reward as well. With it comes struggle. With it comes sacrifice. So he led by example. The Prophet didn't say, you know what? I'm going to chill with my Ferrari. You know, I'm going to sit and I'm going to be, you know, taken and you guys walk. No, he was with them. He felt their pain. He felt their suffering. Now, when... Abu Sufyan heard that there was a big army headed by Abu Jahl heading towards Badr, that area, towards Medina. He decided to send a message to say, forget fighting Muslims. We don't want to do this. This is not right. So he sent a message to Abu Jahl and the army of Quraysh and said, where was he? He was still with the caravan, remember? He was still trying to come back from Sham, right? And he said, I don't want to fight. Let's just go back. Abu Jahl refused. Abu Jahl insisted and said, no, we will go towards Badr. Muslims, when they reached this particular site, what happened? Quran tells us in Surah Al-Anfal, and time doesn't allow to go into details of the ayat, but beautifully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so meticulously, so precisely tells us where they sat and where they were positioned in the battle itself exactly where the Muslims were and where the polytheists were. And they were somehow in a land that they could see the polytheists a bit, bit higher than them, right? But the Muslims, when they reached, they could not see the polytheists who were coming. And so the Prophet of Islam went and sent, sent Amir al-Mu'mineen with a few others to scout, try and find out how many of these mushrikeen were there. And they captured a number of slaves who had come to drink water from the well. There was a well there that the Muslims eventually captured. I saw the well when I went to Badr last month. It's still there, but now it's full of rocks. By the way, do you know what they did in that well? 
When the Muslims defeated the polytheists in Badr, they threw the bodies of the 70 mushrikeen in the well. And the well is still there, right? But there's no water in it. So, Amir al muminin when he captures those slaves, he brings them, and if the Prophet asks him, how many mushrikeen are there? They say, we don't know. He says, don't you know how many people? He says, no. He says, okay, tell me, what do they eat? He said, we slaughter a, a, a camel every day. How many camels? Yes, we slaughter nine to feed the people. So the Prophet said, they are 900 to 1,000. Because every camel feeds 100 people. So Rasulullah, brilliant mathematicians as well, he would calculate that the numbers were what? Around a thousand through how many camels they would slaughter. What happened was though, now it was the 16th of Ramadan, a day before the battle. The Muslims felt incredibly tired and sleepy. Allah says in the Quran, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ النُّعَاسُ amana." They felt very tired. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as a result of you being tired and sleepy, Allah sent much rain. So the skies became cloudy. The rain became to pour heavily. But the position where the Muslims were actually was brilliant. Why? Because they were in such a state that the water they benefit from, but it didn't impact the ground. Why? I saw it last month. There was a number of hills that were sandy in nature. They were like golden sand, right? And according to Riwayat, it's the ones that the Malaika descended. The Malaika, they descended on the day of Badr. I saw a Riwayat in Bihar al-Anwar that says when the Malaika, thousands of them descended on this mountain to support the Muslims, they resembled, they looked like Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu One of the mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he sent them rain so that they can do ghusl, they can do wudu, and also help them when it comes to not being sleepy. Because how many people could sleep when it's raining? Right? So they were benefiting from the water. The Quraysh, the army had arrived. Now their area where they were positioned were full of puddles and they struggled because the water was pooling up for them. The water was actually detrimental for them. Now, that night was not an easy night for Muslims. Do you know why? Because they knew they were outnumbered by three. They knew that the Quraysh were more vast in their capabilities and it was the first time they would encounter a battle under Islam and under the Holy Prophet of Islam. Yet this is an important lesson, my dear sisters and brothers. Wallah, please, if you've switched off for the last... 20 minutes, 25 minutes, just switch on back for the next two seconds. Today, many a times when we are in a battle against many corrupt thoughts, ideologies, many actions that we consider to be immoral and against the religion of Islam and other religions. Like for example, the rise in LGBTQ, plus, 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 plus. Yes? When we are facing this, some people say, forget it. We are weak. We are low in number. We cannot achieve much. Yes? They will normalize and they will push this agenda through our schools and our kids and TV and Hollywood and soap operas, everything. It's there, social media. What can we do? That's it, we accept. That night also resembled the eve of Karbala. Why? And it resembled another story in the Quran and that is Talut. Talut, yes, who is the king of Bani Israel, was fighting which arrogant king at that time anyone tell me jalut in english he was goliath right so quran says how many of them were with talut what's the number anyone know how many people were with this king talut that allah sent to help bani israel kill jalut and dawood salamullah alayhi the prophet was with talut how many of them were there 313 Subhanallah, 313, notice the number, notice the reoccurrence, yes, but that night was very difficult, so some of the Muslims were concerned, some of them were scared, but here comes the powerful leadership of the greatest and the choicest and the best, 
the Holy Prophet وسلم, would reassure them. The Prophet of Islam would come to them and give them as much positivity and hope that you know they are with him, that Allah is with them. And the verses of the Quran would strengthen their resolve and determination and their commitment. And that's why if we look at the Quran, we see it's incredible how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you and I truly believe in him, we should never be shaken. Allah says, never be fearful. Never be frightened or what? Saddened about the past or the future. You are superior if you're truly believers. You are actually superior because you have Allah Taala with you. Now, interestingly, the Quran says, وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرًا وَلِتَطْمَئِنَّ بِهِ قُلُوبُكُمْ وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal verse number 10, 10 is what? You were scared but Allah gave you that strength of the heart which sometimes we need, that hope, that optimism. It all comes from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala but through holy individuals like the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. And that's how the role of the Holy Prophet of Islam and Amir al muminin was so powerful on the day of Badr. And that's why on Friday, 17th of Ramadan, year two after Hijrah, the Prophet of Islam demonstrated his brilliant military expertise. He knew that there were 700 on camels. He knew there were 100 on horses. But the Muslims were what? All on the ground. And you and I know, you've seen enough movies, right? Where if somebody is riding a camel or a horse, they have an advantage over somebody who is on the ground. They can easily strike them much easier, right? So what did the Prophet do? Most of us have seen the film, the message, film al Rasala, grown up with it, right? I think the generation now doesn't watch these kind of films, sadly. But I remember when I was a child, there was no Netflix, no internet, no Insta, alhamdulillah. All we were watching is the message. And we grew up watching that film, The Message. Yes? How many of the youngsters have actually watched the film, The Message? I don't think so because it was made in the 70s and people think it's old. But it was really inspirational for most of us. Because many of the content, although some were disputed, but our ulama in Lebanon approved it. The Shia ulama. Anyway, so the Prophet first lined up a group of men, like Salah, two rows. The first row were the people with spears and long sticks. And the second row were the archers. So they were not at the beginning. So the mushrikeen did not see the archers. So the moment they were about to charge, the ones with the spears were able to push them. And the ones with the archers came out and what? And struck them with their bows and their arrows. But... Of course, before that, what happened was the confrontation. And the confrontation resulted after the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him and his family, made the supplication. You know, if you study Badr, you'll find that there was many du'as. Many times the Prophet would perform this supplication to ask Allah. One of them, he said, Allahumma hadhi Quraysh qad aqbalat bikhiyaliha wa fakhriha tuhadduka wa tukadhib rasulak. Ya Allah, this is Quraysh coming with its arrogance, with its cavalry, trying to deny your Prophet. Allahumma fa nasraka alladhi wa'attani. Ya Allah, I want a victory you promised me. That moment, Quraysh come up with three individuals. They were Utbah, Shayba, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah. Now, Utbah is the father of Hind. Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan. And, of course, she had her brother as well, Al-Walid. Now, these two came. Shayba is the brother of Utbah. So, the father of Hind, the uncle of Hind, and the brother of Hind. All three came up. The first three individuals that volunteered to come up were individuals that were not necessarily known at that time. They're called Ma'ud and Ma'ad. Ma'ud and Ma'ad and another person. They said, no, we don't want to fight them. We want people who we recognize. The Prophet of Islam, once again, an important practical lesson, sisters and brothers. If you and I want to lead by example, and if you and I want to be successful, we have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to give. The Prophet of Islam said, fine, I will give the most beloved of people to me, Hamza and Ali. Yes. And the third individual who 
of course, would go is Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib, who is a distant relative of the Prophet of Islam. So the Prophet did not hesitate to, to give forward people who are beloved to him, even though there is danger to their lives. When they came forward, of course, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was fighting Hamza. Al-Walid, his son, was fighting Ali. And the third individual, Shayba, was fighting Ubaidah. The first person who was killed was Al-Walid by the sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then Amir al-Mu'mineen looks at Hamza and says to him, Ya Am, O oh my uncle, lower your head. So what Hamza did was he put his head on the chest of whom? On the chest of Utbah. He put his head on the chest and Amir al-Mu'mineen struck him. And when these two were dead, unfortunately, the third individual was already injured. Ubaid ibn al-Harith was already injured by Shayba, Amir al-Mu'mineen. With Hamza, they go and kill him. Now, when these three enemies of Allah are killed in the battlefield, this was a tremendous psychological boost for Muslims. There is a cries of Allahu Akbar. But now Abu Jahl says, by God, by Lat wal Uzza, I will not let Bani Hashim and these Muslims victorious charge on them. He said, don't kill the Muhajireen. Kill the Ansar. Muhajireen, capture them. He was so arrogant. Abu Jahl, interestingly, Abu Jahl was somebody who eventually was killed in the Battle of Badr itself. And the person who killed him was who? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who used to be his slave. And he was the one who finished him. Yes. Now, when they charged towards the Muslims, the Prophet of Islam was where? When I was in Badr last month, there's a mosque known as Masjid al-Arish. Anyone know what Arish is in Arabic? Al-Arish? The Arabs amongst you? Know what an Arish is? There is, a, there is a clue in the word. Comes from Arsh. So Arish is a place where a leader of an army sits and watches the battle. Right? So they say the Prophet had a spot where he sat and he watched the battle. And that's why they built a mosque. Some of our ulama, like Rahmatullah ala Sayyid Ja'far Murtada Amili, who's written this colossal of a 40 volume uh, Sahih, the Sirat al Nabi, he says it's nonsense. He says the Prophet wouldn't sit and watch because we have riwayat that says that the Prophet was fighting with the Muslims and that Amir al Mu'mineen very, very clearly says how the Prophet was so courageous in the battle itself. Yes? We, in the riwayat, Amir al-Mu'mineen says that he was fighting in the most tremendous of ways. Yes? And so, it's unlikely that the Prophet of Islam had a throne or something to oversee and just watch. And this mosque probably was where the Prophet resided as far as his tent is concerned as far as where he used to stay not overlook the particular battle and not take part in it at all now in this battle 70 of the Quraysh are killed how many Muslims are martyred these are important facts how many times we've learned about Badr but I need you to walk out today experts as much as possible about this battle how many were killed 14. Some say 17, but I saw the name of 14 people. They're made in a plaque outside the cemetery in Badr. And they included some of those individuals who gave their lives in that particular battle. Amongst those who were killed of the Mushrikeen was the brother of Khadija. By the name of Nawfal, Ibn Khuwaylid. The Prophet hated him because he used to instigate people against Islam. Who killed Nawfal, the brother of Khadija, by the command of the Prophet, was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen killed him and the Prophet prayed for him and said, Alhamdulillah alladhi ajabani da'wati fi, because he had sent a la'na on him. Now, very interestingly, according to many riwayat, half of those killed in the Battle of Badr were killed by none other than the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Some riwayat say even more, 36, 40. And interestingly, the riwayat say when he killed half, the other half, he helped in the 
killing as well. So not only half was Amir al-Mu'mineen responsible for, but also he helped the other Muslims. Now, did the Malaika fight or not? This is an important question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ I'm sending you at least a thousand angels. Did they fight? It's unlikely. Why? Number one, the Quran says they were sent لِتَطْمَئِنَّ قُلُوبُكُمْ Number two, if they did, then what's the point for the Muslims to get virtue? The Muslims to be praised. If the Malaika killed the disbelievers, then why are Muslims celebrated and congratulated by Allah? They did nothing. And if the Malaika were there killing the polytheists, then how can Amir al muminin kill half of them and help with the others? So the Malaika that came down on the mount, they were not necessarily fighting in the battlefield. They were giving Muslims strength. Can they give you and I strength? 100%. Can they boost our Self-esteem, 100%. And this is where sometimes when we feel low, we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hold on strongly to him and to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and you will see that happening. Finally, my dear sisters and brothers, what happened afterwards? The booties were collected. There was a, a dispute between the elders and the youngsters. Youngsters took all the booties of war, the spoils of war. The elders said, excuse me, what about us? Allah revealed the first ayah of Surah Al-Anfal. Yes, alunaka anin al-fal. Qul al-anfal lillahi wa lil-rasul. Anfal means spoils of war. Fattaqu Allah wa aslihu that baynakum. Allah uses this example to say correct and make up the relationship between those of your relatives. That al-bayn, yes, those that are relatives and those that you have disconnected from you're not speaking to, you've somehow now don't wish to have any connection with them or relationship with them. SubhanAllah, that's a lesson from the Battle of Badr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is important when it comes to these matters, after victory, don't let the thawab be lost and cause fitna and problems. What do we mean? Sometimes immediately after the month of Ramadan, we go back into our habits. How do I know Allah has accepted my fast? How do I know the month of Ramadan has been successful for me? It's whether I am a better person after Shahar Ramadan, not during it. The test is after, on the first of Shawwal. Am I a better human being or not? If I am, then that means I'm on the progress towards its acceptance. The prisoners were then taken. How many prisoners? According to Riwayat, 70. These 70 prisoners, look at the mercy of the Prophet. According to Riwayat, he stayed up at night, couldn't sleep because he said maybe they're uncomfortable. The ropes around their hands are uncomfortable. So he asked for it to be loosened. Although most of them were disbelievers and those who fought the Islam and hurt the Muslims. Then he opened up a an opportunity for them. Anyone who teaches 10 Muslims how to read and write can, be, can then be freed. Anyone who wants to purchase their freedom can be freed. And including those who, did not, who helped the Muslims in the Shu'ab of Abu Talib in Mecca, in the sanctions, were also freed. And some of them were just freed just like that. They were not tortured. They were not degraded. They were respected. And so respected in the sense that they were not harmed. The other thing that happened, and the final point that I'd like to mention, which is very, very important. And that is Karbala and Badr. I alluded to it already. But the hatred due to the Battle of Badr was the main, one of the main reasons, according to some historical records, that Karbala's tragedy was pushed and perpetrated. This La'een Yazid ibn Muawiyah. What did he do when he had the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada and he was poking the head? Did you know what he said? Layta ashyakhi bi Badrin shahidu. I wish my forefathers in Badr can see what I'm doing now. Excuse me, what's Aba Abdullah al Hussein got to do with Badr? If you think about it, it's got a lot to do with Badr. Yes, he says later, Lestu min khundufin in lam antaqim min bani Ahmad ma kana fa'al. He says, I'm not from this tribe except that I seek vengeance from Ali Muhammad, the family of Ahmad, because of what they did in Badr. Meccans, when they return, for a whole month they were in mourning. You know a sign of people being in mourning in Jahiliya is that women, they loosen their hair and they don't tie it. Right? 
and they were in a state of shock. They were absolutely rattled to the ground and they vowed vengeance and the hatred remained in their heart. Mainly to whom? To Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anyone associated with Ali. So they said Ali was the perpetrator of Badr. And by the way, today, if you look at historical works, just like, uh, for example, Hunayn, just like Khandaq, they will take away the fada'il of Ali as much as possible. That was part of the plan. That was part of Bani Umayyah's orchestrated agenda in order to distort historical fada'il of the commander of the faithful. And that's why the third Khalifa Uthman said to Amir al muminin he said to him, Wallah, لا تحبكم قريش أبدا بعد سبعين رجلا قتلتموهم منهم يوم بدر Uthman said to Amir al-Mu'mineen Quraysh will never ever respect you because you killed 70 of them on the day of Badr and you can recognize the repercussions of this particular event that had what long lasting impacts on Islamic history and the final thing I'd like to remind myself and my dear sisters and brothers in this particular regard is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you and I when we remember the battle of Badr to recall and to establish that once a group of individuals who are believers but also obey Allah and his messenger this idea that we are individuals who are supposed to obey not go by what we think and incidentally what happened a year or so later in Uhud? Exactly one thing didn't happen that happened in Badr. And that's obedience to Allah and the Messenger. And therefore the Muslims were defeated. That's one major reason. Today, if we think we can interpret Islam, if we think we can practice Islam the way we like, then unfortunately that falls under the category of those who are not obeying Allah and his messenger. Today if we say that you know what, I don't like this particular command of Allah, or I don't believe in this, or I'd like to practice in this way, my way, what's comfortable for me. Am I not doing what certain individuals did in Uhud? And certainly I'm not doing what those with the Prophet did in Badr. The obedience, the unreserved, uncut, the categorical obedience to the Holy Prophet of Islam, and of course Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the recipe for success. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وأخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي لهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين.